them, and since they fit with these historical periods as stages of development. And so we characterize, and, and basically we'll, we'll come back to that. I want to come down here to this key thing. The idea from the developmental perspective is that we all start at stage one. You do not skip a stage by definition. Otherwise, you don't have the model right. And you can arrest along the way, which is fine, and people develop however they're going to develop. And then at each stage, we have healthy and pathological forms. So this is a, this is a, a modern and postmodern way of looking at the concept of good and evil. Right? In the pre-modern world, good and evil are, are personified. They're, they're, there's a human form that is the master of evil or the master of good. In the modern worldview, that's all thrown out. And so we get into notions of healthy and pathological to, to try and explain good and evil, better and worse. So just to characterize then these three stages, we start as in a pre-modern religious mythic way. And when we're two years old, three years old, our view of the universe, what we're going through, and if we're lucky, rationality kicks in and we get into a modern stage, what we'll call, which, which does map to these broad stages of history, and, and rationality comes out. In the postmodern stage, rationality goes to a next level where it can start to see network relationships, bigger pictures, systems theories and ideas. It's relativistic. There's not an absolute truth. It's a relativistic truth. It's pluralistic. Different strokes for different folks. We see uh, civil rights, women's rights, animal rights, things like this being invented by postmodern thinking and creation. So the point here from a Sethian perspective, there is a science, and it's an it's a emerging science, of belief systems and how they develop in time. And when I found this, it was like, hot damn, you know, unbelievable. This just helps us tell the story as we go forward from a developmental point of view. And again, this is missing in our larger Sethian dialogue. And if we can add this level of development and get it right, because we can get it wrong, I think there's some real power in our new storytelling and helping to pass this down to succeeding generations. You can just kind of breeze through that slide a little bit. Get out of that what you will. The, and this leads to the integral approach I will talk about in a little bit. to read a quote just to reinforce this, the idea of how I'm situating stages of development. Each subsequent stage is built upon the foundation that preceded it. And this is developmental psychology theory. Each stage in turn creates new challenges that can only be solved by more sophisticated approaches or risk regression and arrested development. Albert Einstein intuited this when he said the significant problems we face can never be solved at the level of thinking that created them. So there's a pressure pushing us to become more complex, more aware, f understand the gaps in, in our knowledge. Now, Seth also has a version of this that's interesting. He says, consciousness by its nature continually expands. The nature of consciousness, as you understand it as a species, will, in one way or another, lead you beyond your limited ideas of reality. For your experience will set challenges that cannot be solved within your current framework. Those problems set by one level of consciousness will automatically cause breakthroughs into other areas of conscious activity where solutions can be found. So I maintain there, there's a Sethian view that is developmental in just framework one terms. Overall, it's nonlinear, and we can get into simultaneous time and all those paradoxes. So continuing our story then of pre-modernity, modernity, how did modernity react to the perennial wisdom? And this is just an, a, a large summary. Descartes reduced the idea of causal consciousness with a capital C to a body-mind with consciousness now with a small C that science could measure. 
the mind, the soul, the spirit was left to the church and it went its merry way. By the 18th century, Newton outlined the mechanical laws that govern this body-mind. In the 19th century, Darwin and Wallace detailed the biological evolution of natural selection that randomly produced this body-mind. In the 20th century, then, the lineages, the students of William James in the US, Freud in Europe in the US, codified modern psychology. The consciousness of the body-mind was reduced to a byproduct of brain chemistry. Body in the form of quantum fields, DNA, genes, hormones, caused mind. Consciousness exists in the modern materialist view, but it's an epiphenomenon. It's an after effect. It's an accident. It just dirt turns into us. <laughs> Welcome to Flatland. <laughs> the value spheres, art, science, and morals are further fragmented, not integrated. And just a quick point from a developmental point of view, in the most general way we talk about it is differentiation and integration. Differentiation and integration. Through every stage, you can just look at your childhood or an acorn sapling tree, there's a differentiation. That acorn's not looking like an acorn anymore. Not like, you know, a, a, a butterfly emerging from the caterpillar to the butterfly. Differentiation, integration. So. The idea of development overall, that, that we look for integration, and then of course there's a natural process that splinters this apart. But because of the modern reaction to pre-modernity, these value spheres are further splintered, not integrated. Further, modern science declared its way of knowing the truth as the only way, the only valid way is through the third person perspective where everything's objectified, third person language is used, its surfaces, exteriors. It's the only reality. And that's a dominant view right now today in, in our world. Scientism becomes the religion of science that dominated the three value spheres. And scholars have written pointing this out. Evolutionism, a cousin, and Roger Ebert didn't like it when I mentioned evolutionism. And I also and I also likened his presentation of uh, Dawkins' uh, view of standard evolution to uh, a high school presentation that we all know and we're, we're taught with. That pissed him off. He didn't like that. But, and I mentioned evolutionism, too, that it's a, it's a religion of its own right. And there, there are certain irrational assumptions contained in all of that. But it became the official myth or explanation of consciousness. That's the dominant myth, uh, creation myth of the modern world right now. So today we have creationism, a hangover from pre-modernity that's still with us. And this is further evidence of these stages that we all started stage one. Why didn't religion go away? Why is it still here right now? Why are, of the six billion of us, manifest right now about 60% of us still creating our reality through that lens? And it's because we all, the, the evidence seems to indicate we all start at stage one as a focused personality. So what we have then are our are, are, are battle of worldviews, pre-modernity, modernity, and now this emerging postmodern worldview that we're all part of. There are three major areas of worldview dynamics that are areas of friction and conflict. And the better we can learn to discern these things, perhaps new solutions can, can be made. And the intelligent design movement is just there as an example of, of traditional pre-modern thinking that's still with us and dominates. As of 2005, there were 17 states debating legislation to get intelligent design on high school curricula in science classes. It's a big deal. It's a big, big controversy. OK, okay that's, that's a, a general one. You don't have to think about that. <laughs>
postmodern definitions of spirituality versus religion. And there's a distinction that seems to be coming out in postmodern thinking that what we call spiritual is, is an individual approach to our source, our interiors. And then the religious is an institutional or organized or communal way of dealing with that. So that's just a general definition we'll use as we go forward. Ken Wilber wrote a beautiful uh, little essay called Person-Centered Civil Religion in his book, One Taste. And the light bulbs just went flashing left and right. It's like, this is what I do. This is what we do, in my opinion. It's a person-centered civil religion. There's no pope. There's no central authority. It's a decentralized pursuit. And yet, we naturally come together and form groups and explore this. And then we go back our merry ways and continue, with, galvanized by our own authority. And who was it? It was Mary yesterday. And her talk had a great quote of... Uh, the authority of the psyche, you know, and Seth promoting that you are your own best authority and to learn to learn to do that, learn to create that way. That's the big challenge of conscious creation as, as we all wrestle with. These two terms, translative and transformative, are a way of looking at sort of a horizontal and vertical uh, view of framework one, what, what we do, and the translative uh, versions of spirituality and religion tend to ignore stages of development and have feel-good practices which have healthy and, and not so healthy forms. Transformative pushes on development, altered states as a mean towards growth, but both are important. So from my perspective, we want to avoid extremes. If we go too far on the spiritual side, translatively, it leads to narcissism that elevates egocentric adolescent behavior to deep spiritual realization. We can all think of examples in our own community of this kind of behavior in the name of Seth. I moderate email lists. So I'm there in a very public way. And I see a lot of behavior over the years. And so my opinions are based on that experience. And it's daily and weekly and monthly. And so I don't come to these lightly. But that's the negative side, if, if we go too far on that side. Too far on the translative religious side, we inhibit growth and arrest development. We don't want you to think. It's all figured out. This book has the absolute truth. You don't need to think about it or question anything. It's all right here. Just come, all that, and you'll go to your heaven, and everything will be fine. The transformative side, when we go too far, we live in caves. We sit there and meditate. We connect with the divine within, and we don't come back to the community and share our insights. And this is a key challenge of avoiding extremes, in my view. The transformative religious side will promote sinful self ideologies that deny the flesh. So they're aware, they're developing, they're, they're connecting with source, but suddenly source is everything, and the part that is here physically is, is turned into a sinful self ideology. So a middle ground, translative spirituality that promotes abundance, wellness, and fulfillment. We do this in our, with our Seth work. A transformative spirituality that promotes various roads towards the inner self, towards the remembrance of source. So our work in New Worldview promotes both of these, but we do focus on translative and transformative spirituality from an individual sense. So it's a very frothy, chaotic interaction of people coming and going. Ah, finally, Seth. We're going to talk about Seth now. I get to talk about Seth. In my view, it's, it's a postmodern translation of perennial wisdom into a postmodern context. So it skipped those first two stages because it came through Jane and Rob, who were already developmentally at that place, and Seth could work through them this way. It's not offered as an absolute, but as a flexible framework. Seth never claimed to be an infallible source, and this is something really important. And I always read this quote. I'll read it again. This is Seth now in early sessions, uh, book two, session 47. Truth contains no distortions, and this material, with all my best efforts and yours, of necessity must contain distortions, merely in order to make itself exist on your plane. I will never condone an attitude where either of you maintain you hold undiluted truth through these sessions. Inner data, even this, must make its entry through some distortion. We must always work together, but you must never consider me an infallible source. This material is more valid than any material possible on your plane, but it is nevertheless to some degree conditioned by the camouflage attributes of the plane. There's two ways of looking at this quote. The way I focus on is Seth as an infallible source. He is not to be considered an absolute authority in every proclamation of every sentence that he says. We have to interpret it in, in, a, in a way. The fundamentalists in the Sethian community, and again, this comes from my experience on email lists, 
some of which you may have participated in, some of you out there, focus on the latter sentence there that says, this material is more valid material possible than any other on your plane. It's the best. It's the only. It's the now, I, I hold it as the gold standard, but again, it's important to maintain that Seth is an infallible source. What happens is what I call Sethism, where Seth is, and I define that as when Seth is the only valid or best source. And I also call it Seth in a vacuum when I get my critic's hat on. When we're just, it's self-referential. If we stay in the 40 books of Seth, we get in these self-referential loops where we, this is real, but maybe there's something else out there too. Thinking of stages of development and problems coming up and new things coming out of that. We sense that, we intuit, we intuit that. So my advice is get a second, third, fourth, et cetera, opinion. And what I've found in my own practice, my own work, then I come back to Seth refreshed with new eyes and new things emerge from there that I wouldn't get had I just stayed in that body of work. So comparing Seth to other bodies of work is very important. Central theme, you create your reality. But the way I look at this is, who is this you that creates 100%? How do we each, for ourselves, define the you in you create your reality? Who is this you that creates, not 99, 99.99, 99, but 100%? How do you define that? How does causal consciousness function in relation to physical, non-physical fields? We get into a fancy word that philosophers use called ontology, which is the nature of being. And this is my view of a Sethian ontology of the you that creates 100%. And of course, we have the focus personality, which is Jane's term in her aspect psychology, a source self using Jane's term again, which is a Seth-like layer of self. And then Seth talks about these primary pyramid gestalts. He also calls them life clouds and dreams, evolution, and value fulfillment. These are three zones, frameworks, layers nested together. This is the total you that's creating 100%. And so that's why I say I, 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 acknowledging these different aspects, create my reality. <laughs>
uh, in, in the postmodern worldviews. Seth's high intellect from the unknown reality is an exemplar of this. He calls it a superb blend of deep intuitions, inner senses, and intellect that forms a higher cognitive faculty. Higher implies some sort of stage of development in framework one terms. Where this is all leading, I believe, and it's really exciting as the, the not an omega point in Teilhard de Chardin's view, but a sort of a next major, where this postmodern era is, is going, and perhaps in a thousand years or more. Seth's dream art sciences from the unknown reality outlines exemplars that use this high intellect that show the emergence of new cognitive functioning. And from a scientific point of view, from an epistemological or way of knowing point of view, this would be how uh, perhaps this, is, this might be a directionality in evolutionary terms to what we're heading towards. A pull is being exerted from them in a probable future that exists simultaneously in framework two, pulling framework one towards it. The first three are from Seth's unknown reality. Quiz time for you experts out there, the dream archaeologists. Does anyone know where that came from? Tell me the book, which, which Jane Roberts book, the dream archaeologist is from. First, um, I, have a pri I don't have a prize to give out, or a banana. <laughs> which, which Oversoul 7? OK, anybody? It's from the third one, the Museum of so Oversoul 7, the Museum of Time, Leona and Monarch. They're searching for the codicils. They're dream archaeologists. And so it's, Jane provides us with an exemplar of what this higher cognitive function may be like someday. And then the gifted amateur, an expert in any field. Jane was a gifted amateur in the field of psychology. I'm a gifted amateur in the field of psychology. We're all gifted amateurs in the fields that we're trying to use Seth in. Uh, who can tell me where the gifted amateur comes from? I have an orange. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. Stump? Um, no. It's in there? OK. OK. We'll, we'll check. We will check that. We'll send you an orange in the mail if we can confirm that. It's also mentioned by William James in the After Death Journal as he's describing different things from his perspective. We'll check that, Robert. OK, next, please. Seth introduced these 10 or 11 laws of the inner universe in the early sessions of book two, book one and two, I think the end. And then in the individual and the nature of mass events, he calls them natural law. And he defines that. And there, the quote, I believe, was in the, is in our handouts in the folder, where he defines what he means by natural law, that it's not the laws of our scientists, the, the modern materialist laws. These are deeper laws. And in fact, all consciousness units, if we take CUs as the fundamental isness of all that is, all consciousness units are imbued with these abilities. And so the infinite, infinite creativity of all of that is naturally imbued by these natural laws. That goes to the depths of, of isness and being. Just going to briefly mention this because I, I, I wrote an essay on this. And I finally got to the level where I was comfortable. I offered $200,000. It was a joke. But I offered $200,000 on SethNet to anybody who could come up with a practical, ethical, moral overview based on Seth or Sethics. And I want to acknowledge J.C. Mackin. Some of you may remember him from the Elmira conferences who coined the term on SethNet back in 99 or, or there. They're about. So it's a thread of conversation on Sethnet, Sethics, a Sethian view of, of ethics. And basically, when I got this developmental material, it allowed me to take the Sethian notion of natural guilt, natural time, natural aggression, natural grace, and so on, and plug them into a developmental scheme uh, that's been outlined by Lawrence Kohlberg, Carol Gilligan, and many others who, who do research in that area. And just the, here, this is a four-stage model of how in focus personalities in framework one terms only, our sense of morals and ethics emerge. So the first one is ethnocentric, I'm sorry, egocentric. It's me. It's all about me. When I'm a two-year-old, it's all about me, my fun, my food, my diaper, whatever. And then we grow up ethnocentric. We start to relate to our family and others. That doesn't relate to the tribe over the hill. We can still kill them. They're bad. 
But here with my tribe, with my group, that's an ethnocentric view of things. And there's actually some of that in, our, in the Bush administration. Uh, <laughs> actually, a lot of that. Um, World-centric, there's some world-centric in the Bush administration too, but I think that gets forced on them. They kind of, okay, we have to talk about it this way, so we will. We'll include that too. You know. um, but that's a view of all of us equally. And again, civil rights, animal rights, gay and lesbian rights, that is a world-centric ethical or moral view of things and applying basic rights to people. And then just topping it off, a cosmocentric, all beings in all fields. Uh, awareness and in the traditions, the Buddhist Hindu traditions, the, the loving big heart, big mind practices lead towards that kind of cosmocentric approach. Not easy to do. So I've, I've left out a ton of stuff, and it is, there is an essay in the library on New Worldview, and it's in the integral section. And this is actually at the end of the conscious creation myth from Dreams, Evolution, and Value Fulfillment. There are four moral imperatives that I was able to pull out of the Seth material. I think that he's challenging us all to, to follow. And, and the cool thing is we can look at these four things and we can look at them from these stages of development. There's an egocentric interpretation of this where I shall not violate. Well, I can pull the legs off of a spider. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's all about me. I'm not violating. I don't know any better. The nature of violation at an egocentric stage is different than as we learn through experience something in the nature of violation, Sethian violation, emerges in our awareness where maybe that spider really needs its legs and I should stop doing that. And so a, a, another level comes out. So each of these, we have never told anybody to do anything except face up to the abilities of consciousness. This is a call to transformation, a transformational up the ladder kind of thing to develop our abilities a call to practicing idealism. And there's no set definition of that. There's an egocentric version, ethnocentric. We're all interpreting that in our own way. And then, of course, the ends don't justify the means. And we can debate how we define the ends and how we define the means, and we can go through egocentric and these other levels. And we start to situate, we start to understand why some people, some countries, some governments, some organizations, some companies, behave the way they do, because they're at different stages of development. Okay, next.